Hi there, welcome back to Kindness is Essential, Not Optional, the Dog Training and Behaviour Conference 2023. Today we are speaking to Sindor Pangor. Sindor is a, a canine behaviour consultant, a Maya therapist, an engineer by qualification and an educator in Bangalore, India. She's a TEDx speaker, the author of a book, Dog Knows, and an independent ethology researcher studying the free living dogs in India. Sindor is the founder of Barks, which offers a UK accredited level four diploma on canine behaviour and ethology, and both students from all parts of India and across the globe. Sindor is also the country representative for Pet Dog Trainers of Europe, the PDTE, and is currently pursuing her master's in anthrozoology from Exeter University in the UK. And today we're going to be speaking about the lives of streeties. Enjoy. Hello, Sindor. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, I'm so happy to be here and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. Something a little bit different. I think a topic that we definitely haven't covered at the keynote conference before. So I'm really excited. So just for anyone who doesn't know you just get just yet, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do with dogs? Sure. I'm Sindur. I, um, I teach about dogs. I used to work as a behavior consultant with dogs, but now i um, I teach about dogs. We offer a diploma on uh, canine behavior, but I also research free living dogs. And that's really my passion. And uh, a lot of what I teach is inspired by uh, what I learn from them. So our motto at uh, Barks is uh, learning to learn from dogs. And that's what I hope to bring to all of you is lessons that I have learned from dogs. Yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> Um, and a question that we're asking everyone just to get started is, what does connection between dogs and people mean to you and why is it important? Um, so again, I think I'll bring in my perspective of working with free living dogs. And I think one of the most amazing things about, there are lots of free living animals all over the world and India is a very biodiverse country. We have lots and lots of free living animals. Um, I now live outside of a big city. I live on a farm here and there are lots of free living animals here. There are peacocks, there are snakes, there are mongooses. Um, and of course, there are dogs, farm dogs mm -hmm. who are just sitting right there and watching me. <laughs> <laughs> Taking um, part. Yeah. And what I find with dogs, um, uh, which makes them so unusual and special is that they're... Um, Perhaps the only species who are so willing to come and approach us, befriend us. Uh, it takes as little as a smile in many cases, not all cases, of course, but in many cases, you just look at them and smile. So in Bangalore City, I, I live on the outskirts of the city, inside the city, the dogs are so incorrigibly friendly that <laughs> you just need to most most dog lovers or dog people uh, often will comment that you just have to walk past uh, a streetie and the streetie will suddenly just stop, turn and look at you as if they just know that you're a dog person and come straight up to you and you smile and that's it. You have sold your soul <laughs> kind of a thing to them. So I think as a species, these and remember that these are not pet dogs. These are not ex-pet dogs. They have not been brought up by dogs. So the connection is not coming from some kind of a conditioning. They are um, what uh, a mix of uh, the land races, which is, you know, sort of not breeds, but the equivalent, which is um, a product of natural selection, not not. Mm -hmm. Um, human um, uh, intervention there, uh, <clears throat> active human breeding. Um, so these are dogs that have been free living animals for generations. They have learned from dogs how to be dogs. And a big part of their learning or their, their culture of, the, of these animals, uh, particularly in friendly cities like India, is that they are... Uh, they are just very eager to connect with humans. They're very willing to connect with humans. Um, they're very willing to forgive us for all, all our folly. They mm. uh, are extraordinary at communicating with us. We don't need any training. They're able to get all that they need from humans um, uh, with 
uh, you know, with such ease, they're able to uh, say things like, give me food, give me medical help, come and help my friend who's in trouble. Um, mm. You know, all those kind of things that they're able to communicate with no training of uh, any kind. This is just in them. So I think, and and this is the part of the conversation about dogs that I find missing. Um, this fascination about, as a, you know, when people say, dogs are a human's best friend i genuinely think that this there's, there's more than just a modicum of truth there you know there, it this it's just i think there's something between our species um mm. we co-evolved uh, remember that they're not a product necessarily of domestication we co-evolved and they evolved to really uh they're like a they're like a wonderful married uh, couple kind of a thing, <laughs> right? They 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 let go of the bad things that people do to them and are willing to give us a chance repeatedly and connect with us. And when the biggest thing that I have learned, you know, when we talk about connection, not only are they hyper connecting with us, but when I learn to read dogs, when I learn to read their body language and how they communicate with each other, I see that there's so much similarity between dogs and other animals. They're able to communicate with each other quite effectively using similar signals. And so suddenly I'm able to see so much of the animal kingdom communicating. Suddenly I'm able to mm -hmm. understand so much of the animal kingdom. So I kind of call themselves, I call them the... Uh, ambassadors our ambassadors into the animal kingdom once yeah. we learn how to connect with them i think we can connect with a lot of other animals so they are not just connecting us connecting with us so it's that it's not just that connection but they're connecting us to the natural world uh, and i think if we took a step back let go of a lot of our hubris and let go of our intent to try and control them, but rather gain some fascination about who they are and try to communicate with them. I think um, uh, we the, we will get to enjoy uh, kind of these deep connections with um, the animal world, the natural world, the earth, the soil, ourselves, um, uh, and I think it's uh, it's a very healing and a very, very special thing. Definitely. It's really, it makes you feel quite inspired just even listening to you talk about that, to be honest, because as you were talking, I had like an image in my head of a time where I went on a walk with my dog and we sat on top of a, a massive hill for about two and a half hours. We did not move. We did not do training. We were just watching and there were horses that came past and watching him calmly like you say, connect or interact with other species, squirrels, whatever. Like, and I just sat there and watched and it was like so peaceful. <laughs> yeah. um, but I really, really love the idea of what you said about them being kind of our ambassadors or our link with the natural world, which we just get detached from so easily as humans, don't we? Yeah. We are so easily sucked into technology and everything else. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. nice to, to pause for a second and take all that in, I think. Yeah, I think that pause, that's that's a critical thing. I think culturally, so many of us have been almost kind of trained not to pause. This, the fast lane is good. Ambition mm -hmm. is good. You know, hard work is good. Uh, and anything that goes against it is labeled bad. So rest and slowing down, you know, it's, it's slow. It's, oh, you're resting, you're lazy. You know, those kind of terms are used and so the discourse has been heavily in favor of speeding up uh, but uh, slowing down pausing and mindfulness and today I think there's a lot of emerging science about the value of mindfulness mindful presence mindful eating mindful consumption mindful existing all of these and it's at so many layers right our own mental and emotional health the health of the planet the health of the society around us the support that we provide for each other um and i think animals do that very easily and dogs can demonstrate that to us so if we learn to slow down for them and with them i think uh, at least i can say for sure that um my life has become richer calmer I've uh, I've been through a lot and I think it's helping me cope and heal in ways that nothing else can. Mm. Nothing can cut through the pain of things like most of us are living silent lives of extraordinary pain. 
Yeah. And uh, and we are constantly looking for what can help us. And the truth is, most of us don't know. We haven't discovered that thing that helps us. But uh, I've definitely seen that the way they ground us and they make us, uh, they can show us, not make us, show us uh, what it means to just sit down, take it in. I, I watch Chiru's, you might see her kind of walking up and down on the back there. <laughs> and she's just been exploring this entire site uh, that I have. And every day she finds it's endless, the kind of thing she gets fascinated about. She'll look at a butterfly and she'll look at it for a really long time. <laughs> then she'll look at a leaf that has just fallen down and she's gathering. So, And I, I, and I keep thinking, I used to tell my late husband, you know, she would sniff, sniff, they sniff, 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 sniff. And I would say, can you... How how amazing would it be if they could tell us what it is that they're gathering from all that sniffing? Yeah, there's something yeah. that they're gathering there. If to, if they could tell us, they could. They're they're able to sense so much more. Their perception is so different. They're able to sense so much more. Maybe we are very disadvantaged in that sense that we can't perceive everything that they perceive. But uh, I my experience is that even just being fascinated by it and paying attention to what she pays attention to. Um, cuts through a lot of the pain it gives those moments of peace that we so crave those precious few moments before you know life kind of takes us away and you know we're on to the next task so yeah, uh, yeah I, I I'm just uh grateful for that definitely and she just put well a dog just popped up behind your shoulder that's I don't her. know if that's that's, <laughs> that's <her>. her. <laughs> she's like you were talking about me hi <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I think that's that's so true it's I think we spend a lot of our time as humans trying to dull that pain, don't we? What can I do to make it go away so I don't have to think about it, I don't have to feel it, I don't have to relive it and experience it. And often, like you say, we don't get very far because maybe we can numb it temporarily or just for a short amount of time and then it's back. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas if you instead try to kind of be with it, but also like you say, to be with nature, to be with animals, to feel that kind of peace and calmness, that does feel more healing sometimes. That's certainly my experience as well, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we try to distract ourselves. Uh, I remember um, I lost my husband two years ago and, you know, I've learned a lot in the process and I've, I was given a lot of advice, you know, come on, let's go shopping. Come on, let's mm. go uh, to a pub. Let's do this. Um, some people, um, it's terrible. That, uh, that that year was a terrible year. Many of us lost our uh, loved ones. And so the people that I was talking to, uh, people were talking about burying themselves in work, burying themselves in um, substances, uh, yeah. you know, all kinds of things. And these are all ways in which we're trying to somehow either escape or, like you said, numb it. Uh, and uh, I realized in the end, nothing works because you're coming back to that heavy, heavy pain. But the few moments, you know, especially in early grief, the few moments of respite that I got were the moments where I genuinely connected with Chiro, my dog. I looked into her eyes and she had this, I love you, but I'm concerned about you. And I would look back at her and say, and I didn't try to hide it. I Mm. I, I spoke about it to her not that she's necessarily going to understand but she dogs are so good at um, sensing our emotions so she would yeah. kind of um, not necessarily listen to my words but be present with me in my pain uh, and I learned to sit with my pain and uh, and uh, experience that moment of connection and that moment was like this like a like a firefly flitting by in the darkness you know that mm. it's just that little bit of light and it gave me hope it kept me alive and again it brings us back to the idea of dogs being humans best friend because yeah. I think the way they can do that the way she was present for me uh, after my uh, husband died we went into a lockdown the COVID lockdown so I really didn't have anybody else around me either yeah and um, my goodness my dog uh, I owe her a lot Mm. Uh, she kept me alive not with not with fancy talk therapy or uh, uh, you know uh, uh, distracting me with uh, uh, taking me to a party but genuine authentic connection that that has the ability to slice through pain and give you that little bit of hope that tells you okay what is tomorrow worth living for for that mm -hmm. moment that precious thing that you feel in your heart 
I'm getting carried away now. <laughs> no, but I, I really appreciate it. And I know everyone else will too, because I've had those moments myself, for sure. Where you think, oh gosh, I don't think I can get out of bed today. This is too much. And then the little Staffordor comes up to the side of the bed with his massive head and he's like, hey mom, I need the loot. <laughs> and it's even that sometimes can be enough to be like, right, okay, yeah, I want to do it for you. And then when you do it, you're like, actually, we're both benefiting here this yeah. is really helpful so yeah, yeah for sure <laughs> okay so thinking moving on a little bit to think about the street dog or streeties as they're called aren't they it's really fascinating I think especially like the cultural difference so here in the UK we do not have any dogs that live on the streets um if you find a dog you would be like this dog is lost I need to help this dog and find get find their person um so it's really interesting whenever I go to countries where there are dogs that live outside and and that like you say have never been in a human home for example like it's, it's amazing to see um what's the kind of what's their kind of day-to-day -day life like what do they kind of do on a day-to-day -day? what do you see them experience right so before I talk about that I want to take a moment to uh, explain the term streeties because um, not everybody's familiar with it and it's not a technical term at all <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a, a great term, term though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of people call them stray dogs or feral dogs and these are very uh, uh, could not be more wrong um, these are free living dogs and that's probably the technically uh, uh, most accurate term for them but still it falls severely short of uh, describing who they are and giving you an idea of the different kinds of lives they live um, they live many different kinds of lives these are dogs that were born on the streets brought up by other dogs for several generations they are mixed breed dogs uh, mixed with a lot of European breeds uh, that's another thing that a lot of people think that they're a specific breed unto themselves they're not uh, for more than 500 years, uh, you know, from the colonial times, we've had a lot of European dogs being brought into India. And these mm -hmm. are dogs that have been mixed with them. So you may see dogs that look like uh, my, the most, uh, my favorite example to quote is uh, one of the times that I was um, uh, uh, in Bangalore City, I saw a dog that looked a lot like a uh, Senenhund, a uh, um, mm -hmm. A mountain dog a Swiss mountain dog and uh and I was like why does a streetie in India look like a Senenhund that makes no sense <laughs> uh, until two days later I see somebody walking a Senenhund in front of my uh, uh you know office and I was like ah I know what happened there <laughs> <laughs> yeah figure it out <laughs> yeah so um, so these are mixed breed dogs and they kind of represent uh probably the uh common denominator of all dogs all over the world um, but uh, you're not going to see one common behavior across all of them. Um, so now I'm in the farm out here. So the streety is a term that people in cities like Bangalore and Mumbai use. It's a term of endearment and I love using it because I want to make it very clear. I love these dogs and, you know, that's where I come from. Uh, and those dogs lead a slightly different life compared to, for instance, the dogs out here on the farm. So I've been calling them farmies. Um, whereas, uh, and I've heard people talk about different, almost different ethograms, almost different behavior catalogs uh, of dogs in the mountains versus dogs in beaches. Um, uh, to, to the point where even their social structure can be different, the way they procure food can be different. Some dogs, particularly uh, in India, if you're looking at dogs that live um, away from human existence, uh, they're likely to live in larger groups. Mm -hmm. uh, they're likely to rely more on uh, scavenging and hunting uh, to procure food. Whereas if you come into towns, villages, and cities, um, they are they they may they have loosely defined groups. Uh, so they're not pack animals the way people describe them. You know, I've spoken to canine experts in different parts of the world, and one of them was talking to me and said, "It's not you know a lot of us think canines. You know that whole 
wolves and dogs and other kinds of uh, animals that fall in in that uh, larger bracket are all pack animals they're not wolves mm -hmm. are somewhat unique in that dogs uh, their social structure is highly fluid um, and uh, the way they procure food for example in cities they rely primarily on begging of and, course <laughs> yes and we all know how good they are at it and guess where <laughs> it comes from <laughs> so they uh, it's a difficult question to answer how do they live their lives because what i'm trying to say is they're highly highly adaptable animals their lives revolve around human beings and they will uh they change to meet the requirements to survive around the kind of human beings that there are but overall, I would say that, uh, you know, again, people have some strange ideas about how these dogs live. Uh, overall, they are relaxed dogs, are relaxed animals, almost lazy, if I could use the word without the negative connotation in a very nice <laughs> way. Uh, they sleep for long hours. That's their favorite activity. It's about 50% of their activity budget. You know, multiple ethograms have revealed that. Um, they, uh, they watch a lot. They sit and watch mm -hmm. a lot. I did a little study, a little ethogram, uh, um, uh, that I was trying to figure out. So about four years, I tried to capture all their activity, but, uh, activities and put them, put it in a budget. And I saw that if they're not sleeping, they're mostly sitting and watching, standing and watching, lying down and watching. So they watch a lot, mm -hmm. uh, which also makes a lot of sense, you know, keep tabs on the human beings and what they're yeah. doing. And uh, they spend some amount of time looking for food, but not as much as people would think. Again, I think a lot of people like the idea of, I've seen a lot of people say, okay, they're primarily, initially, a lot of people said they were primarily hunters. Now people say they're primarily scavengers. And so uh, they're constantly looking for food not really if they have a chance so the ones in front of my house that the ones that are sitting there uh their their primary activity in the day is to sit and watch my gate like a hawk waiting for food to arrive <laughs> and the yeah. coppingers talk about this too and they have a very interesting way of putting it wolves evolved to cover large distances to find and procure food while dogs evolved to sit in one place and wait for the food to arrive be it garbage or something else and mm -hmm. they just sit and wait and uh so you see a lot of their li life is about sitting and waiting watching sleeping napping um so i think that uh mental picture is something that i would like for people to hold while we go through this conversation as they're not hyperactive animals mm, that is really interesting i had always wondered if they did a lot of sniffing as opposed not necessarily sniffing looking for food but just sniffing but it sounds like maybe not so much they're more kind of watching than using their nose yeah mm. so this may again be uh uh something picked up a little bit more by the streeties and maybe a pet dog's may or may not do it that much i'm not sure how that works but definitely these guys are uh, you know, uh, strong, uh, strongly, they, their visual integration is very good. So they, they do that a lot. They do sniff. So they will kind of, you know, primary information goes in through the eyes. And then when they have the courage to approach um, something, and then the next, you know, it's sort of a double click, right? Okay, let's mm -hmm. get the next level of detail. And that comes through the nose. So I guess they definitely get richer information, a lot more detail, but uh, they rely on their vision a lot as well. They have to, especially if mm -hmm. they're around a species called humans who yeah. are very good at, I mean, while we are great to them, we are also terrible to them, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, watching... Uh, us watching our action watching our intent is a huge part of their lives yeah yeah it's adaptive isn't it because you have to be aware of your surroundings for the positive reasons and the negative reasons as well yeah. and I guess kind of even thinking about busier places busier cities with vehicles and things like that they need to be aware of moving out of the way and it's always amazing watching that there's some farm dogs near me and you drive onto site and I remember the first time I was really anxious I was like is there a dog there I'm gonna run it over and the dog was like I don't, I don't, you know, I'm fine. I can move around yeah. your car. Stop stressing. Um, yeah. But yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. So I, 
you know, now that I'm talking about it, it definitely makes sense that our pet dogs would follow a similar strategy to, uh, you know, companion dogs and the dogs, you know, amongst human beings. Because again, I think they get a lot of cues about our intent, what we're planning to do by watching us, you know, and uh, we did do this test with uh, the streeties where we try to see how effectively they respond to our body language. And it's just remarkable, just a slight change in expression. So they listen as well. So slight change in tone, slight change in body posture, you know, a relaxed posture versus a stiff posture. Now that many of us would have experienced you stiffen up and your dog is immediately going to be like what mm -hmm. do i need to worry about something are you planning to get me food <laughs> am i you know <laughs> yeah. are we up is something going to happen are we going to go out for a walk because their entire lives revolve around us so and quite honestly we're not very good at giving them indication of what's coming next so they're constantly guessing right yes. this, yeah. they're constantly playing a guessing game they're they're trying their best to predict how their day is going to be because they have no control over it. And a large part of it is going to rely on uh, not just the, the the schedule that we put up for them, but our moods. Our So mm -hmm. how many of our dogs know when we have an emergency call, they know it. When yeah. we have uh, my, this girl of mine, she used to know the the ding sound on my phone when I ordered food on a food delivery app. <laughs> and I paid for it. And she would be like, did you just order food? <laughs> Uber Eats is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So, and we've seen this, right? We have seen so many of our dogs know when you're getting ready and you're planning to take them versus you're getting ready and you're not planning to take them. And they know mm -hmm. without a doubt. And I think they they do watch very carefully. They listen. Um, I, I don't think we give them enough credit for how much attention they're paying to what we do definitely and it's making me think about the classic examples of as soon as I get on a zoom or as soon as I answer my phone my dog starts barking or I'm out with my dog and I stop to talk to someone and my dog starts barking or whining how can I get them to stop barking and it's like well your dog in that moment is saying I know that this means that actually the focus is now not on me and that you're doing something else or it's like you say, they're trying to kind of figure out, mm, okay, so the last time that she did this, she, she was there for ages. When am I going to get yeah. my dinner? Like there's lots of kind of, they're problem solving all the time, aren't they? Thinking, oh, yeah. what does this mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I did notice something else, especially during the lockdown. Um, and, you know, after uh, my husband passed and I had another dog at that time. So she passed around the same time too. So mm -hmm. my house went from having a lot of laughter to deathly silence. It was just me and her and my grief and, you know, her confusion and grief. So it was deathly silence. And the only time I would have genuine laughter was when I was on Zoom calls or when I was teaching classes uh, and I was actually connecting with people. Again, we back, come back to the connection thing, right? And dogs mm -hmm. are drawn to that connection. So the second I would sit there and start talking and I would have mirth in my voice and I would laugh and she would come running saying, are there people? Is it happy yeah. times again? Can yeah. I join in? And she would be very confused about it. She was, you know, you're laughing. You're so, it sounds like, you know, you're connecting with somebody and I want to be part of it, but where is that somebody? Yeah. So I can understand the confusion around this. Many of us, I think, experience that during the lockdown where the dogs are like, where's the party, dude? I mean, what mm -hmm. happened? What happened to all the people who are coming over and I could be the center of the attention and the conversation and suddenly that's missing. Yeah, The joy, uh, you know, that, that there is something electric about connection where we all sit together and talk and laugh and dogs so want to be part of it. Um, an example comes to mind, because El Elvis is one of the farmies who just walked in front. The last time we had a team over here, we were building a house with mud. And so we're kind of stomping on the mud, like, you know, grape stomping. Mm -hmm. And so we had a circle and we were stomping on it. And these farm dogs and Elvis in particular, they all decided that they want to come and help. And they were <laughs> all there. They just wanted to be part of it. Aww. And Elvis was right in the middle. And we, and of course we all started laughing and I, I'm yet to see a dog who doesn't enjoy the sound of human laughter. I think there are yes. studies that do show that they're highly cued into human emotions, particularly positive emotions. But I got to experience that that day in a very special way where 
Elvis was right in the middle, looking all around. Everybody is laughing, and he's like, "I'm doing something right! Yay! <laughs> I'm going to continue doing that." He was not useful with the stomping, but boy, did he have fun! <laughs> that doesn't matter. It's the it's the trying that counts. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, it's so true. I was having a conversation with someone the other day, again about the kind of oh, why does my dog bark when I'm on the phone conversation? And I said, well. When I thought about it from my personal experience, I'm the only human in my house. So when I talk, I talk to my dogs. So Mm -hmm. when I start talking, it's, hey, how you doing, buddy? Do you want to go outside? What should we do? So actually, when I pick up my phone and say hello, the dog's like, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that's where it came from. And it was almost like the penny dropped. And I was like, oh, yeah, I get it now. So yeah, totally. I really do tune into that. (laughs) Okay, so I, what I really wanted to cover with you um, today was thinking about some of the myths about streeties or dogs that live outside, because I know there are lots <laughs> um, yeah. and it would be really helpful to kind of dispel some of those, I think. Um, yeah, if, if you're happy to do so. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 and I really enjoy talking about this because um, I think it, it's so critical for us to start understanding. I have a lot to say about street days and then in the coming years, um, I'm planning to get a trap camera and put it out there to get footage of what these dogs do when we are yeah. not watching them. Uh, and I want to present it to the world. But before I do, we have to get some fundamentals straight. So first thing is they're not stray animals. Stray dogs are have strayed from somewhere Mm -hmm. these dogs haven't strayed anywhere they live here they exist here this is their home they they are the uh the initial inhabitants of this place uh they're not feral that's not the right word for them they're extremely friendly um and uh they're not wild that's another term that i see a lot so wild dogs particularly in a country like india we do have something called the wild dogs they live in the forest and they're not dogs they're not Canis familiaris. They're Kion Alpino in India. I think in Af- Africa has another kind of wild dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a whole other species. So looking at dogs in the wild is a little bit of a myth. They don't really exist in the wild. They exist around human beings. So that's the other very fascinating thing about dogs. I think um, uh, Dr. Badra's lab uh, in Kolkata in India did a study where they showed that most animals given a choice tend to uh, gravitate away from humans at least when they uh, have their young but not mm-hmm. dogs uh, repeatedly they no matter how crowded it is they they stay very close to us and i think the study even uh, showed that dogs were whelping in places like railway stations and mm-hmm. markets wow. so human existence doesn't bother them at all so that's the other thing they're not wild animals they're not feral animals they're not wary of human beings not unless we start capturing killing them Mm -hmm. so that happens in a few states in india so in india it's illegal to capture kill or relocate street dogs because Mm -hmm. the constitution recognizes that when you relocate a dog you take away their chances of survival because they are territorial animals Um, but uh, state governments will repeatedly uh, uh, ignore this and will sometimes try and capture them and kill them and so in those places you do see them wary of human beings but Mm -hmm. not in places for instance Bangalore City has a lot of people who are fighting tooth and nail for them and you know care for them and they are very very friendly animals so it's something that i hear a lot of people say oh don't adopt street dogs because they're wary of humans uh-uh not at all <laughs> no. the three in front of my house well there are four one of them is a little nervous he's never experienced human touch but the three there they nobody can come into my house without getting jumped on and you know licked <laughs> and all three of them if you let them they have their tongue right in your mouth <laughs> so, that's really uh they're very friendly animals second thing uh is um they uh like i mentioned they're not very active animals they mm-hmm. tend to be very lazy uh again not in a negative way but you know they're relaxed let's say that they're you know that's a better thing they're relaxed they're calm uh I also hear a lot of people talk about how these dogs, if not trained, can get very aggressive. Uh, That's also not something that we see a lot of. They are extraordinary at conflict resolution without causing physical damage and harm to each other because... Mm 
no matter who wins in a fight in a street fight if they sustain injuries they can die of infection and maggot infestation and things like that so the fittest dog is the one who chooses not to fight knows how to walk away from a fight and knows how which fight to walk away from and which one to actually bear down on mm. so they are extraordinary i you know the great at diplomacy the great at negotiation uh, <laughs> i see that our companion dogs and our home dogs don't uh, match up to their skills in terms of social skills they are not great predators i don't see them doing very well in that area i mean if if they live within cities they do very poorly if they live completely away from human beings they survive us at the end of the day so they pick up the skill i think it's there yeah. but it's kind of dormant it's not what they're they're not very efficient hunters when you think of super efficient hunters you know in the animal kingdom many of them mm-hmm. come to mind dogs are probably not so <laughs> kind of not so much <laughs> but what they do very well that no other species can do is to walk up to a random stranger who's standing outside an eatery in india and to convince this person can you give some of that money to the person there and buy me that cookie and give it to me <laughs> how they manage to do that is just amazing so any time you come to india if you are especially in cities like bangalore uh around lunch time you know there are a lot of bakeries and uh, tea shops and things like that just watch you'll definitely see a dog sitting there waiting and you make one single eye contact and you're in trouble you're buying that <laughs> that dog something so i think that's that's a, that's another thing that i think a lot of people don't um recognize and appreciate about dogs and so we get very mad you know we talk about meeting their needs let's get them to scavenge let's get them to sniff this and that and when they beg for food it's bad behavior but the truth yeah. is they evolved to do just that those big eyes the way they're able to influence you know all those happy lovey dovey hormones in us um i think uh, we forget that their i think their superpower is to be able to know who is that one human who is going to fall for this and how do i get them to do it that would definitely be me i would be feeding <laughs> everybody constantly <laughs> yeah yeah and the other a uh, big myth is their social structure the idea that they are pack animals is just not true they they live in kind of loose knit groups uh they have a little bit of allegiance to the group but not necessarily and they will mingle with members of other groups and for instance i have seen dogs um, there's one group that i was following following for almost a year and it was a mixed group of dogs of several age groups and they all came together in the night when it was nap sleep time uh, which made sense kind of you know sleep together so that you know one can be alerting if mm-hmm. if necessary but when it came to looking for food i found that um the older ones had found themselves patrons and they would just wait it out while the younger ones would go looking uh, for food um, scavenging maybe searching exploring new eateries and uh, i found that the younger ones of one group would meet with the younger ones of the next group and go mm-hmm. together and um, especially the juveniles it really felt like a bunch of uh, young people bar pub hopping uh, <laughs> kind of a thing you know they had the kind of oomph with um, uh, and about them and they would in the evenings they would kind of uh, go away and they had found a butcher's and they were very happy about it and again dr badra's lab has a very interesting study that says that during the monsoons which is roughly when the dogs come to heat around here uh, you f- you tend to find a lot of them walking together in pairs mm. it's their courtship Yeah. Uh so they and I have and I I think I have a video of this where there's I followed these guys for the entire season there were two of them who were courting and there was old chaperone with them as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so you see how mm. varied uh adaptable and complex their social structure is and i think that's another thing that we tend to oversimplify and that may be one of the bigger myths that is out there so interesting and so much of it can be applied to sort of companion dogs as well right because 
we do control so much of their lives and kind of feel that we we are needed to make all these decisions for them. But then you look at these dogs who are doing wonderfully, not just surviving, but thriving, right? Um, from their own volition. So it yeah. kind of it gives us a bit of insight into, oh, maybe I could just loosen up a little bit and see what yes. happens. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think there's one part of it is loosening up to see what happens. The other is the importance of um, agency and control in one's own well-being, emotional mm. well-being. And again, there's a lot of study. I think uh, there's a lot of work by Sapolsky uh, on this and his book talks about a lot of studies on the impact of control and uh, how it uh, can stress one out mm, and kind of returning back even a semblance of control. Uh, can can go a long way semblance of agency can go a long way and then there's the third aspect of it which I kind of I'm really pushing for and I do that with my students in India for sure is dogs learning how to be dogs from other dogs let's not kid ourselves we can't teach them how to be a dog yeah. that dogs have to do that and this is something I find remarkable is we don't so for instance if I'm going to be learning about say chimpanzees I'm not going to go in there saying okay my textbook says a chimpanzee needs to be this 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 you're not that so you need behavior modification that's <laughs> yeah. not what we do right we go see them for what they are and we learn what chimpanzees are by observing chimpanzees but with dogs we don't want to extend that courtesy we don't seem to understand that dogs know what dogs are supposed to be and mm. dogs need dog role models on how to fit into um, social uh, norms of of the dog world how not to get into a fight with a dog and still be able to disagree and not necessarily be friends is something that we can't figure out that's right. something that they need to teach each other you know I see Chaita is the the mum here and Iti and Yaya are her puppies and she's uh, uh, been she sits at the back and she observes and she watches and I don't know how the knowledge transfer happens but I have seen her, seen her puppies over the last year. Now they're juveniles, uh, have been learning social strategy from her. So they have similar social strategies like her. And it's not, it's not a blanket statement. Every dog has different social strategies, but they are learning from her necessary social strategies because her strategy has made her successful enough to mm. live in front of my house. She has earned my favor. And so those dogs are learning how to do that. How do I impress this woman? Because this woman <laughs> seems to get food and cookies, you know? Yeah. And they've learned that from her. And um, and, and I'm seeing dude, uh, one of the other dogs there, teach Chiru how to uh, behave better. The farm dogs around here have a certain way of playing. And they, he's teaching her in a very nice and polite way. And she is... Uh, learning very slowly but learning and it's not something I could ever teach unless I want to go down on my knees and willing to sniff her butt <laughs> it's not something I'm going to be able to teach her um, if if there's one thing I would always want for my dog is to have the luxury of or have the advantage of learning from good dog mentors how to be a dog mm. Definitely. And sometimes it even goes a step further, doesn't it? That not only do we not have the ability to teach them definitely, but also we actively stop them from being a dog yeah. a lot of the time. I see this all the time in the park where a dog goes to greet another dog, sniffs their bum as they should do. And the human goes, don't do that. Don't do that. Because it's yeah. socially unacceptable to us somehow that the, that the dog is doing that or yeah. anything like that and immediately kind of stops that interaction um which if anything is going to cause frustration I think for a lot of dogs um or confusion oh is that not what I'm supposed to do so yeah, yeah. we can get in the way <laughs> a lot of the yeah. time yeah yeah another practice that I see people do a lot is uh, asking the dog to sit or we enter mm -hmm. the dog park there are other dogs you sit here and you watch till you're able to be calm enough Sitting is also part of communication. Dogs use that to communicate. Yeah. Uh, you are interfering in their communication. Don't complain then if your dog is not able to make friends because you're not letting them do 
be polite in the dog way you know yeah. talk dog speak dog and say hi the way it needs to be or not just say hi maybe there's a impolite dog i see a lot of companion dogs don't have great manners compared to our streeties here they kind of very head on they don't necessarily mm. do the song and dance that's necessary to establish friendship so they just come you know charging yeah. <laughs> Chiru has learned a little bit more thankfully because she's had exposure to street so she's learned a little bit more of polite ways of doing it so she hates that approach and so if a dog comes up to her straight up she's like ah uh-uh, nope nope i yeah. don't want this i don't want to be friends with you go away figure out a nicer way to approach me now if i were my older avatar before i learned how to do these things and i was largely doing training i would have said hey that's a friendly dog so you better behave why are you doing this mm-hmm. why are you walking away uh, you are supposed to sit and wait and i i even tried that I'm so embarrassed to say it but i did i tried yeah. that you know the right thing to do is to sit politely and wait and then get up and greet the other dog now that i've learned how to appreciate how dogs actually meet i see that chiru's way of greeting and meeting other dogs uh is so unique and i put up videos of it every once in a while um she has a, you know my students and i talk about this the chiru dance she has a very special dance that she whips out you know one step forward one step back look this <laughs> look right look left sniff sniff p and this a whole bunch that's going on that sequence is beyond my comprehension let alone being mm. able to teach her that yeah fascinating isn't it and yeah she's developed that on her own through yeah. learning with other dogs yeah mm. uh I can talk to you all day Cinder this is so interesting <laughs> but I know we've got to finish in a second just before we do I know you have firstly a free gift for our listeners could you tell us a little bit about that one please yes so it's uh the first chapter of my book it's called dog nose learning how to learn from dogs mm-hmm. uh and it's a book that where I try to put my own learning my own life as you can see my, my life my emotional journey what i've done with dogs they're all kind of they all go hand in hand um and so i've kind of presented open my heart and presented it out uh <clears throat> and i've also kind of brought in the science where it's necessary but i think most importantly uh it's uh, the story of the love the great love that i shared with my older dog nishi who passed away my husband who passed away and uh the, our family unit and how we learned uh, our struggles and our growth together so uh that book is me sharing a bit of my love with all of you readers thank you thank you and i know you have one other thing as well could you tell us a little bit about that one too yes please? it's a 10% discount on um the foundation workshop that we have canine essential 101 which is a pre-recorded uh workshop um that introduces you to all these ideas about how dogs communicate inherently without training what is it that we can do we live our lives here without having the need for it so i'm sharing that you have lifetime access to it and students who do canine essential 101 also get a hefty discount on what we call uh, the barks auditorium the auditorium includes live sessions that we do every month where we create a safe space to discuss a lot of kind of radical ideas so if you're into that and you like ag ideas uh this might be of interest to you perfect thank you and just lastly where can people go to follow you to find out more about you uh we have a website www.box.com bharcs.com and we are on uh instagram it's called box education we are on facebook box we are on youtube um yeah that's as far as we've gotten we don't have tiktok in india so <laughs> <laughs> that's okay we'll put all the links to all of those bits down below thank you so much again for your time really appreciate it my pleasure i love talking about streeties so every time somebody invites me thank you so much <laughs> take care